the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair and Rare Book Cafe. This is Book Week, your weekly look at things going on in the world of rare and collectible books. There's an upstart in the charts. Uh, the Guardian reports that for nine decades, the New York Times bestseller lists have been the industry gold standard when it comes to obtaining a seal of approval that will make readers sit up and pay attention. But like most things in the book industry, it's something Amazon has in its sights. Last week, the online retailer launched Amazon Charts, which complements the site's usual hourly updates of best-selling books. The new list combines what's being ordered from them with data obtained from Kindle and Audible users to find out what books are actually being read and listened to. It's an interesting algorithm and one that has been utilized before, but never formally by Amazon in this way. In 2014, the mathematician Jordan Ellenberg created an index of the most abandoned books based on Kindle data. So while every man and his dog might have bought a copy of Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time and Thomas Pinketty's Capital in the 21st Century, not actually not everyone actually read them. Amazon Charts, the Guardian says, might open up a whole new set of booksellers based on books actually read and on books bought as coffee table status symbols. But will this carry more weight with the publishing industry and readers than the venerable New York Times bestseller tag, which has been the go-to example of bragging rights since 1931? On the face of it, Amazon charts might democratize and reevaluate the bestseller concept. But on the other, like Coca-Cola, KFC, and Big Mac special sauce, nobody really knows what actually goes into the New York Times bestseller list. It certainly isn't just a roundup of physical books bought over the counter at bricks and mortar stores. A request for an explanation and a breakdown of audience figures for the various New York Times bestseller lists, which are posted online, was greeted with a firm, we don't share traffic data at the section level. And as might, you might suspect from anything that is driven purely by computers and algorithms, Two authors are already announcing plans to write an Amazon bestseller under the new system. Canada-based life coach Mark DeVoe and Mark Stay, who work in a publishing house in London, are attempting to write a book that will top the Amazon chart listings in any category and are charting their efforts in a weekly podcast called The Bestseller Experiment, in which they view, uh, interview other authors at, aiming for the same dream. So apparently we can now look forward to reality television programs uh, in which uh, aspiring authors try to game the system and the ratings in order to yell at the end, I won, I won. In other news, The Atlantic has a, a story about uh, moral failings associated with reading. It notes that in years past, the family monitor assigned Lord Walsingham a trendy death. His servants found him in bed one morning in 1831, burned to a crisp. According to a notice in The Spectator, his remains were almost wholly destroyed. The hands and feet literally burnt to ashes, and the head and skeleton of the body alone remained, presenting anything like the appearance of humanity. His wife also suffered a tragic end. Jumping out of the window to escape the fire, she tumbled to her death. He apparently fell asleep reading in bed, its editors concluded, a notorious practice that was practically synonymous with death by fire because it required candles. The incident became a cautionary tale. Readers were urged not to tempt God by sporting with the most awful danger and calamity the flagrant vice of bringing a book to bed. Instead, they were instructed to close the day in prayer to be preserved from bodily danger and evil. The editorial takes reading in bed for a moral failing, a common view of the period. The link between morality and mortality was reasonable in part. Neglected candles could set bed curtains ablaze and in turn run the risk of life or property loss. 
and so to be lie wantonly in bed with a book was considered depraved. It was also bad for authors. Rare Book Cafe has covered in the past stories of famous authors like Thomas De Quincey and Isaac Newton, John Stuart Mill, and Thomas Macaulay, who all lost manuscripts when they accidentally, their servants accidentally, or their pets accidentally knocked over candles and set books ablaze in the days when there were no word processors. Although the Atlantic cautions that in practice, reading in bed was probably less dangerous than public reproach suggested. Of the 29,069 fires recorded in London from 1833 to 1866, only 34 were attributed to reading in bed. Cats were responsible for an equal number of fire incidents. Why then, the article asked, did people feel threatened by the behavior? Reading in bed was controversial, partly because it was unprecedented in the past. Reading had been a communal and oral practice. Silent reading was so rare that in the Confessions, Augustine remarks with astonishment when he sees St. Ambrose glean meaning from a text simply by moving his eyes across the page, even while, quote, his voice was still silent and his tongue was still. There was a view that because digital technology was newer and more efficient, that it was completely better than paper. But in the end, paper and books won out. Uh, one last story that we are breaking this week is a, a, a surprising and rather unseemly squabble has broken out between members of the rare book community this week. Uh, we reported on Rare Book Cafe last week that the Pacific Legal Foundation has filed suit in federal court in California to overturn a California law that imposes all kinds of burdens in terms of record keeping and disclosure on booksellers dealing in signed books. The law was passed as a response to a campaign by the Star Wars actor Mark Hamill who says that forgeries are reducing the value of his brand and diminishing his retirement now that acting roles are less frequent. It ended up scooping up anyone dealing in signed memorabilia. Our guest, Anastasia Bowden, explained how the law is so broadly and thoughtlessly written and was passed with so little thought that it includes books with inscriptions from grandchildren to grandparents in the fronts. Uh, since then, we have obtained copies of emails between the American Association of Rare Book Dealers and its international counterpart uh, to Bill Petricelli, uh, owner of the three-store three chain Book Passage in Marin County, California, reproaching him for causing them problems. Uh, they allege that Petricelli's lawsuit is an affront to the united front that they had established among themselves and endangers the attempt to rely on a negotiating team that has been dispatched to work with the california legislature to unscrew up the problem the california legislature screwed up in the first place imprecations have been flung and names have been called petricelli points out that he has a perfect right to file a lawsuit if he wants to. And on Saturday on the Rare Book Cafe, we will have a guest from the Great Guild of Booksellers to explain why they believe theirs is the only correct path to resolving this problem that affects and afflicts every bookseller in America. You've been listening to Book Week with the Rare Book Cafe, presented by the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair. Join us on Saturday from 2.30 to 3.30 Eastern Time uh, for the Rare Book Cafe, in which we'll be discussing this and other book news. We look forward to uh, seeing you again next Thursday at noon for Book Week. And until then, this is the last chapter.